Hi, this is Ed from 6++ and welcome to a new show, which I will be doing intermittently called The Best Army You Shouldn't Buy. Now that is so named because we have a data slate just around the corner. We have a new edition coming in June or maybe early July, depending on how that lines up. So we're looking at big changes coming. There's going to be changes, for example, capping you at six transports. This army has seven, so already you can see maybe hold off and buying those. Um, but these armies are great to proxy, or if you can scrape them together, if you and a friend have a collection that's sort of between the two of them, you can make that. Or if you play TTS, these are all great armies that I think are a lot of fun to play and maybe a good to improve as a player with. I think this is a great army to improve as a player with. You get lots of tricks out of it. It's the sort of army that you can really squeeze a lot of juice out of once you sort of learn the ins and outs of the army. So as you can see here from the background, I am going to be talking about Harlequins. Fine, slow Harlequins. The internet has nicknamed this list archetype as slow Harlequins because it is basically a lot of cheap dudes in transports that are quite hard to kill. They're going to be flying around the map, blasting you, being a real pain to deal with, dying incredibly quickly once they're out of the transports. But uh, they have a lot of combat tricks. They have a lot of stuff up their sleeve, a lot of... Uh, little shenanigans that they can get up to. I think they're a very fun army to play and I've been enjoying them. So the crux of the list, holy boats. Now this is, as you can see, seven impulses. And that is because impulses are the absolute backbone of the list. You could probably go up to nine impulses if you want to do a slightly different variation of this, but I think seven is a good middle ground. How does it work? Well, it hinges on a couple of things. Black Templars, as their super doctrine equivalent, you know, have all of the Space Marine chapters get one, they get vows. The vow that we'll be looking at here is the one that gives you a five up invun across the board. It's not locked to core, it's not locked to characters, it's not locked to infantry. It's just every model in your army gets a five up invun. The downside to that vow, the drawback, is that you can't get the benefit of light cover. What a shame. I'm not getting light cover on my nine vehicles that I am putting into the uh, on the table. However, will I cope? As you can see, not much of a downside here. The other thing that really makes this list tick and why it's important that you can't just go, for example, Iron Hands, because Iron Hands are pretty durable anyway. Um, you can put free multi-melters on <laughs> all of your Primaris vehicles, which is pretty wild. Um, perhaps that'll change, but I'm, I'm actually not expecting that one to change in the data slate. I am expecting the bottom line here, Codex Warfare, to get changed, either the secondary itself to get nerfed or for the way doctrines work to get nerfed, but that's fine. I think this list is actually future-proofed. I think you could probably play it all the way up to the end of the 10th edition, but we'll go into that later on. Sorry, the end of the end of 9th edition. Absolutely not 10th edition. So what you're basically looking at, the, this combination here is you've got 100 point models, the impulses, which are your transports. They're relatively durable because they've got the five up in one you know, a good bucket load of wounds, T7. They're fairly fast. They've got actually got some strat support, which is quite fun. You also get to put free multi-melters on there because you're getting the defensive profile. You don't have to pay, put the shield upgrade on them. So you're also putting the missile launcher on there just because it's the most efficient additional free heavy weapon you can get in there. And all that means that you're going to be scoring Codex Warfare pretty easily. So this isn't... I think the most refined the list could be. This is what I've settled on in testing. I think you could probably make some changes that would make the list better or make some changes that would make the list play in a way that you prefer to play. You could absolutely drop the Reapers, for example, squeeze in some more uh, troops in transports. You could drop some of the Assault Intercessors and put some more Sword Brethren. I thought one squad of Sword Brethren was nice, just in case there was a particularly sticky problem I had to deal with. But I really enjoyed just the small, cheap obsec units that I could throw away, not care about, very similar to Harlequins. They get the job done, then they die, they tie their opponent up, and it's just a nightmare to deal with. So, quick run through on the list. I started off with the Warlord, Primaris Chaplain on bike, obviously quite a tough character, plenty of wounds. He has Rights of War, the secondary that you see in almost every Space Marine list. Uh, in this list, he doesn't actually need to hold, hand out obsec to many models. It's mostly, honestly, to have it on himself because he's a real pain to deal with. But Rights of War gives obsec and a six-inch aura to all core and characters around him. It doesn't double up, so you don't get double obsec. But that means the Emperor's Champion, the Primaris Sword Brethren, and himself all get obsec if they are within six inches of him. 
Nice to have. He has the relic Tannhauser's Bones. Tannhauser's Bones means that all damage that he takes is reduced to one, not by one, to one. This makes him just incredibly frustrating to deal with. Honestly, you can't send, you know, a five-man unit that you, on the, the verge of killing, you know, Thunderhammers, it, it kind of laughs at Thunderhammers. You want to deal with him with weight of attacks. So we've got the Warlord. You've got an Emperor's Champion as well. I went with the Emperor's Champion because he is the cheapest and best way to get some things that I think are very valuable in this style of list. So he is slow, he's a foot character, but he can go in the boats. So that immediately gives him a little bit extra room. He, however, gets an, a six-inch heroic intervention, which is great for defending your objectives or aggressively attacking their objectives from behind terrain, depending on how you position him. And he also has fights first, which goes hand in hand there. He's just a... He's not, you know, the best character in combat he's quite good at, he's better against characters for whatever reason but he ends up just uh he's do, he does the job he kills things that need to be killed you can't put a chaff squad next to him and expect that they'll take the objective and hold it into your turn on top of that there are five squads of assault intercessors they all have thunder hammers because they're free so why would you not uh you might even be able to give them free pistols i didn't check but if you can do that do that if you can't who cares that's not what they're here and uh, one of them does have the Holy Orb. Now, the Holy Orb is the paid upgrade system, one of the paid upgrades, the relic bearers, not relics that cost CP, relics that you can buy with points. And the Holy Orb is fantastic. You do a couple of mortal wounds, but also, more importantly, you hand out fight last. That's very important for an army that wants to be doing a lot of combat shenanigans, especially when you've got lots of quite squishy units. Assault incessors are good, but they're not incredible they don't kill as much as you might want to you might want to chuck a couple of small units into something or you might want to chuck a couple of you know the primaris and a couple of characters you might want to really focus in on a unit and making sure that you don't get interrupted and those units just blended before they get to fight is a very important tool to have there's also a squad of five infiltrators with the helix gauntlet helix gauntlet's nice just makes it harder for them to shift but really they're here to screen your deployment the worst thing that you can do with this sort of list is allow your opponent to move block you in. Having your own squad of infiltrators usually means that you should be able to prevent that from happening. Most deployment maps, at least the UKTC ones, I can't speak for other deployment types specifically in America, um, but you can protect at least one of the exits from your deployment. Normally there's like two or more if you're playing Dawn of War, but if you're playing corners or diagonals, you've normally got at least two exits from your deployment. Have them just defending one. Throw them away if your opponent has infiltrators. Make sure you're just saying, I will not let you move block me into my deployment and I will continue to play the game. I'll not lose it in deployment. So that's why they're there. I then have a squad of 10 Primaris Sword Brethren. They're fantastic. I upgraded one of the guys with the hammer to be a champion of the feast. Gives him an extra wound, attack, and weapon skill. So he's just making extra attacks with his thunder hammer. He's going to be hitting on threes instead of fours, which is a really nice upgrade to have. And I also took the paid relic Sigismund Seal. This works like the Ultramarine Seal of Oath. Pre-game, or sorry, the start of the first turn, I believe it is, you pick one of your opponent's unit, and the squad with the Sigmund Seal gets rerolls, hits, and wound. Uh, obviously, that you're combat squading the Primary Sword Brethren, so it's only the squad that has the upgrade in that gets that. Funnily enough, I would put that in the one that uh, has the Thunder Hammers. That tends to make the most sense. I haven't listed all the Walker here. Weirdly, you can combine it in pretty much any combination you want to. I found it most effective to put the Thunder Hammers and the Axes together and then just like a power sword on the fifth guy, but give them the four Pyre Pistols. That way, if your opponent tries to tie you up with some chaff, you can flame your way out of combat if you don't get it done in the melee phase and then hopefully charge on to bigger and better things. Then the thing that I think is a little different to a lot of the lists that I've seen is the two Gladiator Reapers. These are great. They really fill a niche that... I think this army really struggles with is lots of chaff, sort of layered chaff. If you're playing into armies that can just stack big squads of gaunts, for example, in front of you, not that that's a good army at the moment, but if you can 
if your opponent move blocks you with 10 beast snagger boys or something something that you might struggle to pick up with the storm bolters it's really nice to be able to pick those up with the uh the high rate of fire that the gladiator reapers can put out you're going to score more codex warfare points and they just generally are very efficient they're also a great unit for you to put in free strat reserve come in get an angle that your opponent doesn't want to have to deal with it makes the play very differently they might try and screen out the board edges which is always funny to see when you're playing an army that really wants to be driving home the center when your opponent is moving out to the sides and uh, i see i haven't put the number there but it's seven impulses multi-melter missile array two storm bolters uh two storm bolts apparently i can't type uh they put out just an unreasonable amount of firepower they're weirdly tanky for their cost they transport all your stuff they make the whole list tick but again don't buy seven of them because in three months time you won't be able to use seven of them so what is the secondary game like well first of all you've got codex warfare you probably know it. You've probably played against Dark Angels or Iron Hands or Space Wolves or insert Space Marine Army here that is abusing and using it to its fullest extent. It's great. You're going to get 15 points of it. It's very hard not to. There are some armies that you shouldn't pick it into. For example, like if you're playing into Custodes that are playing. <laughs> I saw a list the other day, which was three units of bike, two bike characters and two Terminators. Maybe don't take Codex Warfare into that. But um yeah, you could just take no prisoners instead. You wouldn't be wouldn't be too upset. It's obviously I'm expecting to see that go away, but that's fine because you do have three other secondaries that you can go for, and that might change up your list decision if Oath of Moment becomes a non viable secondary. Um, but you are also going to have options. You've got Oath of Moment. This is a great list for Oath of the Moment. You can put a boat in the center of the board if you're playing against a shooting army. That's great because you can move block their guns, potentially, depending on the terrain. You might be able to make it so they only get a couple of activations into the center of the board. So if your impulse survives, great. If it doesn't, no worries. The boys inside spill out, hopefully free from reprisal. Shock tactics, just generally a pretty solid secondary to pick as a positional one, especially if you're playing a melee army. Either you get loads of primary or you get secondary points. There's no real downside to it. It's hard to play around. You can also go for behind enemy lines, potentially. I don't think this list is the best. Uh, or you could even go engage on all fronts, actually. I think this list could play that quite well. I tend to avoid that as a choice, but you've got lots of small units that you can fire off. You can send the boats out into corners, depending on the map deployment. So yeah, I think behind enemy lines would work. Uh, sorry, engage on all fronts would work well. And then the omnipresent banners. You've got loads of squads of infantry, and you're not too upset if one or two of them jump out of boats at the start of the game and do some actions before you go anywhere. Absolutely happy with that. So harping on about Codex Warfare, which may be a waste of time, but I really wanted to just point out how many shots you get with this. You get nine multi multers, you get 18 shots, you get seven shots from the missile arrays, which is basically just a crack missile. You get two of the rocket pods, which is 2d3 shots, I think strength seven, AP1, 2d3 damage, AP2, because you're in Codex Warfare. Um, Devastated Doctrine. And then you've also got two <laughs> twin heavy onslaught Gatlings, which is 48 shots. That's going to pick up a fairly disgusting amount of models. Sure, it might not clear Deathwing Terminators, but you're going to kill more than your opponent might expect for an army that is transports and boys in transports. The thing that really makes this list tick, though, makes it go from just being sort of a meme list to a really strong list, is you have a bucket full of strats. And that's why I started off with, I think I started with this 3 CP. Uh, I specifically took the... Emperor's Champion, because he doesn't cost any CP to do all the things. You can take Warlord traits and get a six-inch heroic intervention and fight first, yada yada, but instead, take a slightly worse character in melee, if you're not tooling him up, and you've just got someone who can do that for free, leaving you CP to pull off these really important strats. So, firstly, Strength of Conviction. One CP. Core unit gets up second in the command phase. Fantastic. It's absolutely great if you've got some sword brethren who have you know survived on a point, your opponent's gone, oh, I'm just going to toe on there with three models, and then you're not going to get it. And then you don't gotcha them. But uh, you know if they don't have any other options, if they can't clear them off, uh, and then you go, cool, I'm spending a CP. I'm going to give them up sec. It's also one of those strats that makes your opponent play differently when you say, look, oh, by the way, if you put your models on there, I can just give them obsec and then they have to commit resources to kill models that maybe they didn't want to have to kill. 
There's a uh, devout push. That is a one CP three inch move in your opponent's charge phase. I believe it is. Um, basically, at the end of their turn, or the when you they can't interact with you effectively, you can just spend a CP and move from behind terrain onto an objective. The way it works is you've got to move. If you're not in engagement range, you can use it to move three three inches, and you can move closer to either the closest enemy unit or objective. I think it's most useful for objectives. Come from behind a wall, stand on the objective, boom. Oh no, I've got twelve. You've got uh, you know twelve victory points where you won't expect me to get any more than four. It's quite a nice one to pull out. Uh, you've got exemplars of the crusade. That's one CP. Slap that on your sword brethren. So sword brethren only. You get exploding sixes to hit. Very nice to have. Um, when you've you've got a couple of thunder hammers in there, maybe you're only hitting on fours. That's effectively a plus one to hit, maths wise. So nice to have. On to the chapter, fight twice. This is only with the assault intercessors. Forgot my words. You're probably not going to use this very much. Their output is middling. It's a lot of chainsaw attacks, then one guy who's incredibly swingy with a thunder hammer. But sometimes you just need to clear off that extra couple of models to make sure that you get an objective, and spending 2 CP there is absolutely worth doing that. Then there is, in the fight phase as well, the Emperor's Honor, which is, if you've played against Blood Angels, you know the Angel's Sacrifice strat for Blood Angels. Basically, it means that you can protect your nice, squishy obsec units by sacrificing a character. It is I believe the wording of it is if an enemy unit is in engagement range of a character, they have to allocate the attacks to that. They can't put the attacks anywhere else. It's it's fantastic. You can heroically intervene with your Emperor's Champion, spend two CP, say, sorry, you're not clearing my obsec off this objective. They kill the Emperor's Champion. You laugh and score loads of points and maybe even fight on death if you want to spend the CP on that. Coming into your opponent's turn, there is Tenacious Assault. This is one CP, and on a four plus with your infantry, you can stop your opponent from falling back. This is an incredibly frustrating thing to have to play against, just in general. Stopping falling back can really mess with opponent's plans, especially if they're playing an army like uh, Tau, who can fall back and shoot quite easily. If you say, actually, on a four plus, you don't get a full back, you've got to sit there and waste your guns. That's a very efficient way of tying someone up. Great little tech piece to have in the back pocket. You've got a Paul the Witch, Deny and a 4+. plus. It would be nice to have more Denies in the army, but you can just spend a CP, pull out your back pocket when you come up against a Psyker army. It makes your opponent very nervy about taking secondaries such as um, what Ritual, which is nice for you. The less easy scoring for them that they can get, the better. And finally, a nice little one that I wanted to pull out, not a Black Templar specific strap, Grav Pulse. I think it lets you fall back and shoot if you wanted to do that, which is actually not a bad use of it, given the amount of strats that you have. And this is for the impulses, sorry. Um, but more importantly, it lets you minus two inches from the charge. Now, I play a lot of Tau at the moment. That's incredibly useful, especially if you're using it as a shooting platform, because you can just position 23.5 inches away from your opponent they go, oh, well, that gives me, you know, with all my bonuses to charge and my advanced charge, I can make a seven inch charge there. I'm not too worried about that. And then you tell them, actually, I've got this strap for minus two to charge. And they go, mm, that's a nine inch charge. Now I'm a lot less comfortable making that. It's a great strat to have. It's one of those strats that you tell your opponent about. It changes how they play. Sometimes you get to use it, but a lot of the time you don't even have to spend the CP, which is the best sort of strat. So that is a quick roundup of the army that I think is the most fun to play that you shouldn't spend our, uh, money on at the moment. Do you have any armies that you think fill this niche? I'm absolutely interested in trying them. I am in a little bit of a rut at the moment. I am very much waiting for the data slate to drop. I don't feel like it's particularly worthwhile developing new Tau lists until the data slate drops. So I'm actually taking Leviathan Warriors to the London Open this weekend coming. So that's how in a rut I am. Please do tell me if you have any armies that you think are incredibly fun to play but shouldn't spend £400 on because they're going to become immediately obsolete. Thanks for your time.